this is my favorite quote from him. He said, it is chloroform in print. It's always funny to see people online use this snide remark from Mark Twain about the Book of Mormon because I've often found that they're not even remotely aware of the context of this particular comment. So let's take a look. Now, I think it's important that we recognize from the start that Mark Twain clearly never closely studied the Book of Mormon. And that was never his intent. You see, because this is coming from Mark Twain prior to being the famed author of Tom Sawyer and Huckleberry Finn. In reality, his only real success at that time had been in writing witty travel journals and publishing satirical articles in local newspapers. In fact, later in life, Mark Twain would regularly recount how childish and shallow his early writings were, as they were primarily catered to the dim-witted and shallow observer, stating that his primary focus was to poke and jest at everything around him for the cheap laughs of his more simple-minded subscribers. So let's take a look at Mark Twain's actual commentary on the Book of Mormon, which appeared in his book, Roughing It. While traveling through the West with his brother, Mark Twain obtained a copy of the Book of Mormon in Salt Lake City. He referred to it as a curiosity, but called it slow and sleepy. He makes his remark that the book is chloroform in print and commends Joseph for the miracle of keeping awake while translating this ancient record. And this is what I find most interesting about Mark Twain's comedic critique, because it directly contradicts the dominant critical narrative of today, that Joseph was a natural and gifted storyteller. Now it's clear from his commentary that Twain had at least read the first several chapters of the first book of Nephi, as he competently summarizes Lehi and his group fleeing from Jerusalem, which Twain claims amounts to plagiarism of the Old Testament, which is a rather bold allegation, when he himself at that time was being rightfully accused of having plagiarized an entire passage of Oliver Wendell Holmes' work. Anyways, Twain then takes issue that Nephi describes his family as having remained in the land of Bountiful for the space of many days, rather than providing a definite amount. And this is one of the first indications, in my opinion, that Mark Twain is only gleaning the book for jest and not actually reading it. Because he's right, there are several instances in which Nephi seems to skim over chronological details as he relates his family's journey through the wilderness. And that's actually an important detail, because a simple reading of the first several chapters of Nephi would lead one to assume that Nephi is keeping a daily journal. But in reality, he's not. When we first begin reading Nephi's account, we have no reason to suspect that these words are already set within a framing story. And then nearly 70 pages into the text, Nephi gives an account of the record that we are now reading. And it is in this passage that it is made clear that everything up to that point is Nephi's reminiscent retrospective account taking place nearly 30 years later. That is to say that Nephi is not recording events as they happen. Instead, he's a middle-aged man recounting incidents from his teens and early 20s with the full knowledge that life in the promised land has soured and there has been an irreparable divide within his family and that the Lehites have since spent years trying to utterly destroy each other. This information is crucial in trying to sort out Nephi's narrative perspective. Because it's only mentioned in passing later in the text, you readers of 1 Nephi would realize that their conception of Nephi is incomplete. From a literary perspective, this is advanced narratology, and it goes right over Mark Twain's head because he's not seriously engaging with the text. We call him the father of American literature. He then goes on with making the mistake of asserting that Nephi builds the ship in Bountiful in a single day, which is very disappointing really only further demonstrates Mark Twain's struggle to competently engage with this text. In reality, the record seems to indicate that this ship took the group two to three years to build, then suddenly leaps forward to the Book of Ether and bemoans the introduction of peoples and places that the reader is not familiar with, such as Coriantumr and Sherid and Lib and Shiz in the plains of Heshlon and the valley of Gilgal and the wilderness of Achish and the land of Moran and the plains of Agosh and Ogap and Rama and the land of Korahor and the hill Comnor by the waters of Ripliancum, etc., etc., etc. His words, not mine. Mark Twain is essentially claiming the Book of Mormon is being too extra, but according to the book's own framework, we are to understand that 23-year-old Joseph is translating the prophetic words of Moroni, who's abridging an ancient account of the Jaredites, according to the words of Ether, which was discovered by the people of Limhi and translated by King Mosiah. So this detail that an obscure ancient record keeper named Ether is taking for granted that the names of his people and places will be completely foreign to a modern reader. It's fascinating. Naturally, a modern 19th century fictional author such as Mark Twain would presume that the narrator owes us an explanation to contextualize the story. But Ether makes no such attempt. Because why would he? It's clear from this detail alone that the writer, Mark Twain, and the author of the Book of Mormon belong in two different literary worlds. And that detail becomes most apparent 
in Mark Twain's final critique of the Book of Mormon. In the very last page of his record, Ether records the downfall of the Jaredite nation that came from internal strife and division, which led to a final devastating battle and the ultimate demise of his people. And the final words of Moroni's abridgment of Ether's account are this, And it came to pass that Coriantumr fell to the earth and became as if he had no life. And the Lord spake unto Ether and said unto him, Go forth. And he went forth and beheld the words of the Lord had been fulfilled. And he finished his record, and a hundredth part I have not written. And that's the end of all we know from Ether. No parting words, no knowledge of what became of him, nothing. And this detail frustrates Mark Twain, as you can see here. And there is a reason for this. Much later in life, Mark Twain would recount an important lesson in writing that he learned from the famous Thomas Fitch, a well-known lawyer and newspaper editor from Nevada. You see, prior to any successful publication, Twain had presented a lecture that Fitch had attended. And after the lecture, Fitch went right up to him and essentially said, Clemens, you are a magnificent narrator. But today you committed the unpardonable sin. You so eloquently captured the interest of your audience with your story and let it all go to waste with the most atrocious, anticlimactic piece of rubbish. Never do that again. So of course it gets under Mark Twain's skin when only a couple years later he reads this crescendo of destruction in the Book of Mormon to the Jaredite people from the perspective of an ancient record keeper named Ether and be left without ever knowing what ever happened to him after he completed the record. And this is where I agree with Mark Twain. Had the Book of Mormon included this detail, the account would be so much more gratifying. But the thing is, and this is the element that a younger Mark Twain seems incapable of grasping, that to include the death of Ether would be to unravel the entire framework. Or in other words, it is quite simply impossible for a dead man to record his own ending. In reality, Mark Twain's roughing it is a pretty awful piece of American literature. And I'm not talking about the quality of the writing, but the content itself. In this work, Mark Twain simply sought to profit off composing a childish caricature of practically every Western person he came in contact with. And that includes his account of visiting the saints in Salt Lake City, where he outright mocks them as he hides behind his privilege and juvenile publications. If you would ever take the time to read this book, you'd come to see just how disgusting his rhetoric is. Not only is his description of all Latter-day Saint women dripping with misogyny, his depiction of the Goshoot Native American tribe that he encounters while crossing into the Salt Lake Valley is absolutely abhorrent. So no, you'll excuse me if I don't give this take the weight that you think it deserves, nor should anyone else. 